Cameron and Robert met. Now Robert later wrote a poem on this and saying that he was at a dance and his dog followed him in and he wished out loud that he could find a love that was so devoted as his dog. And a few days later he passed Jean Armour who was at the common laundry green putting out her washing and she walked up to him and asked has he found his true love? So according to Robert, Jean chatted him up. Jean's mm -hmm. eh? story is slightly different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she says that they actually met at the washing green when she was shoving the dog away because it was about to upset all her laundry basket. And then a the few nights later, they met again at the dance. But Robert, of course, chased her. Now, from what we know of his later life, that's probably true. <laughs> they did meet somehow. And it was much against their father, uh, her father, uh, intentions, wishes for his daughter. But in the prime of their romance, Robert wrote a very nice poem called The Mocklin Bells. And Neil's going to read this out, and it's about the six ladies of Mocklin, which is the town in Ayrshire where they met. And you'll find out exactly what Robert thinks of Gina. In Mochlin there dwells six proper young bells, the pride of the place and its neighbourhood awe. Their carriage and dress, a stranger would guess, in London or Paris they'd gotten it all. Miss Miller is fine, Miss Markland's divine, Miss Smith, she has wit, and Miss Betty is braw. There's beauty and fortune to get we Miss Morton, but armour's the jewel for me or the awe. Now you've got a man writing poetry like that about you, oh. proclaiming to the world that you're his love. So what do you do? Well, she did exactly what most girls do. She got pregnant. <laughs> and apparently when she told her father, he fainted so much that Mrs. Armour had to run for a potion to revive him. <laughs> now, despite the fact that Robert and Jean actually produced a, a very informal marriage agreement, the father was having none of this, and he ripped it up. He sent Jean away to Paisley to an aunt to cover up the fact that she was about to give birth. And Robert went into hiding. <laughs> he literally was lying low. But, unfortunately for the young couple, the Kirk had found out. And the Kirk in the West Coast is very controlling and always on the lookout for sin. And the letter that Jean wrote to the, uh, the, the pastor, Willie Fisher, still exists. And it just says, I am with child, out with marriage, Robert Burns is the father. Yours sincerely, Jean Armour. <laughs> That's it. So she was called in front of the Kirk session. And Robert himself was called in front of the Kirk session. And he had to spend three Sundays on the repentant stool. That was him punished for his sin. Jean gave birth to twin boys and had to deal with that forever after. But Robert, being a poem, poet and a man of words, he got his revenge. And he's got a very famous poem called Holy Willie's Prayer. Now, Neil isn't going to read the 17 verses. <laughs> no. But if you, listen, if you listen to it, what you'll discover is that Willie Fisher, Holy Willie, is a man when it comes to all that. <laughs> and he is just as sus uh, subject to all the desires of the flesh as the people that he's calling up in front of him. But as one of the elect and one of God's chosen, then he you'll hear the rest. Holy Willie's prayer. O oh, thou that in the heavens dost dwell, far as it pleases best thyself, Send aid to heaven and tend to hell, O oh, for thy glory, and no for a naked or ill they've done before thee. 
Ay, bless and praise thy matchless might, when thousands thou hast left in night, that I am here afore thy sect, for gifts and grace, a burning and a shining light to all this place. What was I or my generation, that I should get sick exultation? I, what is there most just damnation for broken laws? Six thousand years ere my creation through Adam's cause. When from my mother's womb I fell, thou might have plunged me deep in hell to gnash my gooms and weep and wail in burning lakes, where damned devils roar and yell, chained to their stakes. Yet I am here a chosen sample to show thy grace is great and ample. I am here a pillar of thy temple, strong as a rock, a guide, a buckler, an example to all thy flock. But yet, O Lord, confess I must. At times I'm fast with fleshly lust, and sometimes too in worldly trust, vile self gets in. But thou remembers we are dust, defiled with sin. O Lord, gestreen, thou kens we meg, thy pardon I sincerely beg. O oh, mate, ne'er be a living plague to my dishonour. And I'll ne'er lift a lawless leg again upon her. Uh, besides, I furthermore allow, we leases, lass, uh, three times, I trow. Uh, but, Lord, that Friday I was foo when I came near her. Or else thou kens thy servant true, who had never steer her. Maybe thou lets this fleshly thorn buffet thy servant, dean and morn, lest he our proud and high should turn, and that he say gifted. If say, thy hand money me born, until thou lift it. But Lord, remember me and mine, with mercies temporal and divine, that I for grace and gear may shine itself by name, and all the glory shall be thine. Amen. 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 So, <laughs> that's Robert's opinion of the church. Now, I mentioned that he went into hiding. When he did that, he turned to poetry, and he wrote something that was later known and published as the Kilmarnock Edition, or the Kilmarnock Volume. It's a collection of his poems, and what, before it went to publication, though, Robert had thought that his relationship with Jean was over because of his, the father's reaction. So he got involved with another lady, as you do. And this other lady was called Mary Campbell. You'll know her through the poem Highland Lassie. And guess what? Mary fell pregnant. <laughs> now, the two of them were planning a trip to Jamaica, the West Indies. Now, if you go further into that, it might be quite surprising that later on in life, Robert wrote a poem called A Man's A Man For A That, about the freedom of men being equal. And yet, when he was younger and in hiding <laughs> in this very early stage of his life, he was actually prepared to go to Jamaica to work for a slave master. It's a thought, and a little known fact, I'm sure. But anyway, Mr. Armour got wind of this idea that him and some lassie were going to Jamaica. So he got a warrant out for this, not quite an arrest, but just to stop him leaving the country. So he was going to make sure that his daughter Jean, who was already the mother to twin boys, could go off with this man because the Kilmarnock edition was suddenly shooting Robert into fame and money. So he thought, okay, my daughter can associate with this man. So he was hoping that being a young girl, she would know how to get a wedding ring on her finger. So she, he shoved her in front of Burns again and said, right, lass, away you go. And guess what? No wedding ring. <laughs> but she did get pregnant again. And this time, it was to twin girls, who unfortunately died very soon within the first couple of weeks of birth. But the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, the relationship did continue. And in August 1788, Robert and Jean were officially married in a church. Now, I ask you, how many people have on their wedding certificate the phrase at the end, 
irregularly married some years before. <laughs> so, uh, but this makes it official. I didn't stop Robert being a womanizer, despite the fact that he gave Jean nine children in all. He also had four illegitimate children, mostly in the early years, you'll understand. Now, I don't think he regretted the marriage, but I'll tell you that later. Okay? What isn't so well known about Robert is the fact that he often wrote for free. He just wanted his work published. And yet, he was very poor, he had to work as a, a tax collector. And really, he should have been making money from his poetry, and he was giving it away to the publishers free. But this, this little life continued, because he was doing it for spiritual reasons and so on, self-satisfaction. Uh, but he was also very musical. He played the fiddle, and he was a great collector of tunes. What he did was collect traditional Scottish tunes, even fragments, in all about 370 of them. And he collected the tune and the words, and if the words weren't suitable for mixed company, he would clean them up. But, on the other hand, if they were perfectly suitable for mixed company, what he did was give them a few raunchy meanings. <laughs> and then, when there was all male company, he had a very body tune for them to sing. And this is how he conducted his life. And Neil's first song is all about the bitterness and the tenderness of love, which Robert knew very well. And it's called The Green Grow the Rashes Oak. <coughs> oh dear, it's not been well. It's recovering from a cold act. Yes. Don't expect too much. No, Neil has been struggling against man flu <laughs> for this very moment. <laughs> There's not but care in every hand, in every hour that passes so, but signifies the life of man, and when a father lasses so. Green grow the rashes, oh, green grow the rashes, oh, the sweetest stars that did I spend, I spent among the lassies, oh. The world the race may riches chase, and riches still may fly them, more, oh, but worldly things and worldly men, will I go and tax ulterior, oh. Green grow the rashes, so oh. green grow the rashes, so oh. the sweetest hours that did I spent, I spent among the lassies, so oh. For you, for you, she do who sneer at this, year not but senseless asses, so oh. the wisest man the world saw, he dearly loved the lassies, so oh. green grow the rashes, so oh. green grow the rashes, so oh. the sweetest hours that did I spent, I spent among the lassies, so. Oh. Of nature swears the lovely dears, a noblest to work she classes so. Apprentice hand she tried on man, and then she made the lasses so. Green grow the grasses so, green grow the rashes so. The sweetest stars that e'er I spent, I spent among the lasses so.